My name is Heather Wright, and this is Zachary and Hannah, and we're going to be lighting the evidence candle today. Every journey faces the unknown, and anxiety can sometimes overwhelm us. There is too much to do, our lists are long, the candles are, our calendars are all filled up. We worry that something will go wrong, or we won't end up in the right place or take the right route. Getting lost is a real possibility on our journey. And yet, we claim hope for the journey because we follow the one who will travel with us and sustain us on the way. Isaiah says that there are who is to come who will be the faithful man of all hope, the spirit of the Lord who will rest on the spirit of his wisdom and understanding the spirit of the counsel and the might and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We place our hope on this one. We light the candles of peace and hope to give us strength for the journey. And let us go into the mountain of the Lord, that God may teach us the way of peace and hope. Thank you. Christ be with you. My name is Katie Graves, and I'm one of the members here. It's my honor to welcome each of you to Mayfield First. We're so glad that you chose to join us this morning. Be sure to grab your bulletin. There's a tear-off form to let us know that you were here, and you may submit a prayer request as well. Also, be sure to look at all of the announcements. Some of them are opportunities for you to serve and participate. Some of them are for those around you. Either way, we ask that you pray for all of them as we take on the coming week together. Speaking of prayer, we're going to pray for one of our churches in the Purchase District. This week's church is Broadway. Their pastor is Ray Chandler. It's here. The candle on your right has been lit to represent them. Please join me in praying for their church. Dear God, we give you the glory and honor for all that you're doing in our lives every day and in the lives of Broadway. Shine your light in them, through them, and over them. May they make a difference in this world for your glory and purposes. Set your way before them. May they reflect on your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. Help them to press in close to you, to hear your whispers, and seek after you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you chose to join us for worship, so we're going to begin with our opening prayer. The words are on the screen so that we may all pray together. God of majesty and power, who spoke and this world was, who breathed and this world lived, who counts the hairs upon our head, who sees our thoughts and reads our hearts, who loves us more than we deserve. How can we not bring today our sacrifice of praise? 
For in the child at Bethlehem lies the promise of intimacy with a Savior who would die even for me, and the promise of an eternity in which to praise each day. God of promise, we praise your name. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his eyes hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's sin. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. It can be found in the United Methodist hymnal, hymnal on um, its number, page 880 or number 880. I'm not sure. It will also be on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten of the, of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son he has worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
ask you about your Christmas tree. What does your Christmas tree look like? I want you to use your arms and show me the shape of your Christmas tree. Okay, so I've got a wide Christmas tree. I've got a narrow Christmas tree. Do any of your Christmas trees look like this? Upside down. I saw one the other day that was attached to the ceiling. Why do you think that was? Because the what? The lights were upside down. The ornaments were upside down. Do you know why they hung the tree upside down? Because they had cats. <laughs> and I'm not sure that they didn't have small children. Because they had their tree hanging from the ceiling, they couldn't reach it. But I was pretty sure, looking at where that tree was and how far it was off the ground, that the cat could probably jump up into the tree still. So I'm hoping that there will be a follow-up, maybe a video of the cat jumping up into this upside-down tree and maybe tearing it out of the ceiling. But it got me to thinking about upside-down and all the things that look funny when we look at them upside-down. I want you to look out on the congregation and turn your head out. Everybody stand up so you can see better. Just turn your head upside down. There's some folks back there that are going to look funny when they're upside down. The whole world looks funny when it's upside down because you're used to seeing the grass on the bottom, the green on the bottom, and the blue on the top where the sky is. But when you're standing on your head, everything looks different. Did you hear the passage of scripture today where the lion is going to lie down with the lamb? That's backwards and upside down. That doesn't make any sense. It said that the lion was going to eat straw instead of the lamb. That's upside down. But that's what happens when Jesus comes into our life. The things that we think make sense are supposed to stop making sense. And the one who is powerful and has big sharp claws and is strong and can do whatever he wants like a lion. He's going to be in fellowship, community, and friendship with even those who have no power, like the lamb. So, whenever you see a Christmas tree hanging upside down, I want you to think about that. But even when you see a Christmas tree right side up, like this pretty one back here in the choir loft, can you see it? I want you to remember that it's supposed to turn our lives upside down. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the lion and for the lamb and for the example that they set for us. Teach us how to live in community and peace with one another, recognizing that power comes from powerlessness. And the example of your son, our king, who came to us in a manger. Amen. Good morning. I'm Mary Ellen. I'm Mary Ellen Reed. Uh, if you will join me in the prayer of elimination, it is congregational, so we will all be together. Guiding God, without the presence of your Holy Spirit, we are hopelessly lost on this Advent journey. Come to us in this place as we gather to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word and our minds to understand it. Amen. The Psalter reading this morning is from Psalm 72, 1 through 7, and then 18 and 19. Your part is in a boat. Give the king your justice, O God. May he judge your people with righteousness. And your glory with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor and the people. Give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. In his days may righteousness flourish. And be 
Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Romans 15, 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. My name is Joey Reed. I'm privileged to be the pastor here. And at this point in our service of worship, the ushers will come among us with plates to gather our tithes, God's tithes, and our gifts. If you're a part of another congregation and you've made a covenant pledge to place your tithe with that congregation, hold on to what you have and take it home with you. Make sure it gets to the place where you have promised it. If you have made that covenant promise here, now is your chance to exercise the promise that you have made. If you haven't made a covenant agreement to place your tithe anywhere, if you don't have a tithe promise that you have made, and you simply want to give a gift that will honor God, we promise you in return that we will use that gift to honor Jesus Christ and the coming of his kingdom, the kingdom that is even now at hand. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you would transform the gifts that come before you that you would transform the giver 
that you would bless us with life so that we might be found in pursuit of your son, Jesus Christ, as the kingdom breaks into this world. We pray in his name.
Cecília. I ask that you join me in the gospel reading from the fifth chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 12. We'll read this together. While Jesus was living in the Galilean hills, John, called the baptizer, was preaching in the desert country of Judea. His message was simple and austere, like his desert surroundings. Change your life. God's kingdom is here. John and his message were authorized by Isaiah's prophecy. Thunder in the desert, prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. John dressed in a camel hair habit, tied at the waist by a leather strap. He lived on a diet of locusts and wild field honey. People poured out of Jerusalem, Judea, and the Jordanian countryside to hear and see him in action. Those at the Jordan River, those who came to confess their sins, were baptized into a changed life. When John realized that a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees were showing up for a baptismal experience because it was becoming the popular thing to do, he exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to make any difference? It's not your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a descendant of Abraham is neither here nor there. Descendants of Abraham are a dime a dozen. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. The real action comes next. The main character in this drama, compared to him, I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life within you, a fire within you, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Hmm. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. And now, Lord, we ask that your presence would be made known, made known among us. Show us the power of your Holy Spirit, not in some visual light show, not in thunder from the desert, but in the still, quiet presence of the Holy Spirit, inhabiting this place and indeed our hearts and minds. For we ask it in the name of the risen Christ and for his sake always. Amen. When I was in the youth group, we had an opportunity to preach for Youth Sunday. And we were trying to figure out who was going to do all that, and the lot fell to me because even in those days, folks were aware that I had a call in my life that I might become a pastor someday. But we couldn't figure out exactly how we wanted to have our service. We weren't sure if we wanted to do a traditional type of service or if we wanted to do something a little different. And the pastor, a beautiful soul, a man named Jim Davis, came to our MYF meeting and he says, I've got an idea. I want you all to raise a ruckus, thunder in the desert, you know, like scripture says. I want you to make a big noise. And then when I ask you what you think you're doing and if you think you can do better, come on down, that's when you guys come down out of the balcony and you lead the service. Well, we thought that was a brilliant idea. And we set about doing that. And the problem with our plan was we didn't tell our Sunday school class teacher that we were going to be doing that. So as we were coming down the steps to take over the service, Janie Bassett was coming up the steps, still had her shoes off. They were back over wherever she was sitting because she had gotten up immediately to come up and, and tear heads off of children, I guess. And we tried to convince her that it was okay that Brother Jim was expecting us and that it was okay that we had made all that noise and that it was okay 
that now the entire service was going to be turned upside down. Every time I hear thunder in the desert, I think of Jim Davis, because he had a big, booming bass voice. And he remains to this day the only pastor that I know who was able to preach with a big hog leg of chewing tobacco in at the same time. <laughs> Y'all just thought I grew up in a city. <laughs> he was all about turning things upside down. He loved it when other people led. He set the example by inviting people to come up and preach on a fairly regular basis. He was excited about lay speakers. He was excited about the pastors who were coming along he was instrumental in me developing my understanding of what it meant to be called into ministry. And he also reminded me on several occasions that turning things upside down didn't just happen as a show. It wasn't just something that we did in church services to shake things up and do things differently. Jim took me to annual conference the first time I ever went. I was nominated, I think by Jim, to be the at-large delegate for the Cumberland District of the Tennessee Conference of the United Methodist Church. There was no badge at that time. It would have been that long if it had been. But when I got there, I was trying to figure out what in the world are we doing? What does this have to do with church? And Jim said, when we do it right, it looks like the last coming first and the first coming last. When we do it wrong, it looks like the people who have already got something, keeping that something, and maybe taking a little something extra from those who don't have much to begin with. And I'm sitting in the pew and asking myself, what does this have to do with annual conference? What does this have to do with church? And I realized at the ripe old age of 12 or 13, that first time out, that that's exactly what annual conference would do if it weren't reined in. And as we came home and Jim was driving, he was my ride to and from annual conference that year. I was asking him if it was just annual conference that had these same structures, where the people who had got more and the people who didn't have started to get less. And he, he said, well, no, that's really the way the world works in a lot of ways. And I think that's where this understanding of what Jesus is saying in the New Testament what the prophets say in the Old Testament, indeed what God has been saying throughout the time of God's interaction with human beings, that's exactly what God has been saying forever. The last will be first, the first will be last. Remember, it's all the younger brothers who get God's favor. Cain and Abel, Abel. All of the brothers and Joseph. Joseph had one brother who was younger and he was kind of the favorite after Joseph left. Jesus came to make that clear to us, that the king that we're looking for is not a king who sits high and mighty upon a throne of gold, but a baby who comes to us in a manger. Jesus lived the great reversal. He chose the great reversal. He went to those who were the least and the last and the lost, and he did not make it his business to participate in self-aggrandizement. He was not about making himself the most important person in the room. He would talk about seats of honor and then sit somewhere else. He would show his disciples that when you put the children among you, that the children are the greatest among us. It's upside down. It's backwards. It doesn't make sense. It's not what the rest of the world is trying to teach us. And as a matter of fact, it's why Jesus was crucified. Every time we speak out against power and people amassing power for themselves, every time we speak out against the, the gathering together of riches and wealth for the purpose of riches and wealth, we're going to make those people angry. Every time we tell them the story that we follow after a king who spoke out against emperor and against the leadership of the church and died for it, Perhaps it gives them the idea that maybe that's what needs to happen. Because if you think about it, anytime someone challenges that which is powerful, that which is in control, that which is in charge, there is a great uprising, there is a backlash, and there's often a punishment for it. My job today is to invite you to be ready for that punishment. 
because I'm inviting you to participate in that great reversal, to speak truth to power, to say the things that need to be said, but more importantly, to do the things that need to be done. But I'm not suggesting that you grab banners. I'm not suggesting that you change your voting habits, who you vote for. That's completely up to you. I've said it a thousand times, and I'll say it a thousand more. What I'm asking you to do is to change the way you deal with the people around you. I'm asking you to look to the least and the last and the lost and prefer their company over the company of those who might get you a little farther along in this life. To take care of the needs of those who cannot or even will not take care of themselves. It's upside down. It's backwards. It's the opposite of what we've been taught. I can remember on several occasions, even my family instructing me when we were walking down the city streets of Nashville, when we were very rarely downtown when I was a boy, and one or more of my family members, my parents perhaps, telling me, don't give them anything, it just encourages them. Don't give them money, they'll just spend it on alcohol. And I think I've told you the story that after I started going to school in downtown Nashville, right there on Broadway, that I befriended a few of the folks who lived out on the streets, who one of them even lived behind the school in the alley. And some of us who had a little extra lunch money gave him what coins we could. And later on that night, he was featured on what happened to be a uh, Channel 5 news story about homelessness downtown. This was back when our mayor in Nashville was dressing up as a homeless person to see what it was like to live down there. So of course that was newsworthy. And I looked over at the television and there was the fellow that I had given some pocket change to. And he was doing with that pocket change exactly what my family had told me he would do. He had a bottle turned straight up right there on the Channel 5 News. You would think in that moment that I would say, gosh, my family's right. I'm never giving another dime to anyone who asks me for it. But Jim Davis' words had gotten into my head. Jesus' words had gotten into my heart. And I'm still kind of a sucker for somebody who tells me that they are having a difficult way to go. And I think we all should be. I think that's the risk you run. You run the risk of being beaten down by the powers that be because you tell them that the poor and the innocent, the lost, the least, the last, are more important than the powerful. You run that risk. And you also run the risk of people who are poor, the least, the last, and the lost, taking advantage of the generosity that is not only the byproduct of the kingdom of heaven, but is indeed the goal of the kingdom of heaven. You run that risk. It's upside down. It's the opposite of what we've been taught. I don't have any better explanation than that. That's the way it goes. I've told you on several occasions that my wife and I, that Lorinda's suffering from an ocular migraine. If you'll say a little prayer for her sometime during the day, I know she'd appreciate it. She's at home now trying to get rid of that thing. But we have a variety of ways that we interact. And one of the best ways that we interact is the fact that we are complete opposites on so many things. To the extent that if she goes to the buffet line and picks out a food item and comes back and doesn't like it, I know that I can go and get it and I will love it. We are absolute opposites. That's the way it feels sometimes. You have to be willing to embrace that reversal. You have to be willing to live with the exact opposite of what you want. When Christmas comes around, I want tiny little white lights on the tree that do not flash and do not blink. Guess what Lorinda wants? Big, colorful, flashing, blinking lights. But don't make them blink too much because it gives her a headache, as we have seen this morning. But you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm willing to live with that tension. I'm willing to live with that backwards, upside down reversal. Because just when I think that all of this upside downness in scripture is going to drive me crazy, I see the kingdom of heaven breaking through. I see the power of Jesus Christ coming to life in the people around me. 
I see sometimes when I'm having a great day and God's spirit is actively moving in my life, I even get a glimpse of it in my interactions with other people. It's not as often as I want it to be. It doesn't happen as frequently as I pray that it would. But that has more to do with me getting out of the way than anything that God's doing. I've been told that the way into this new kingdom is not a revolution like we would expect. You see, God's kingdom is nothing like we would expect, so why would entering into it be revolutionary like it's been in the past? With signs and banners and marching crowds and pitchforks and tar and all kinds of fiery speeches. The way into this kingdom is to follow after Jesus Christ. And the best way to follow after Jesus Christ that I know is simply to contemplate what it means for Jesus to die on the cross for us. Even in this season of Christmas when we're anticipating his birth, the reason we celebrate that birth is because it leads to a life filled with teaching and culminates in a death that is sacrificial on our behalf. If you're wondering what contemplation is and maybe thinking that it sounds difficult and maybe beyond you, it's not. The best definition that I've ever heard for contemplation is that it is a long, loving look. It's that gaze that we give to something that takes our attention, captures our heart, gets into our minds. I want you to take a long, loving look at who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus is going to be. Because as we look to that example, we see that this upside downness is not so upside down after all. We see instead that it's the world that's turned upside down with our power being the most important thing, our riches being the most important thing, our wealth being the most important thing. But it's never been that. The most important thing from the very beginning of time was God's willingness to dwell in our midst. There are the riches. There is the power in powerlessness, perfectly exemplified by a man whose life began humbly in a manger and whose life ended humbly on a cross and whose life triumphantly is glorified not just in resurrection, but in the incarnation that we celebrate every year at Christmas. Completely upside down. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us when we fail to see the wonder of your plans. Help us to turn our heads our bodies, even our lives, upside down so that we may understand a little bit more about what it is you're trying to do. Help us to make heroes of those who have the least and help us to ignore those who would wield power, fame, glory, and fortune. Remind us what it means to give ourselves away instead of grasping and grabbing and hoping and wanting and acquiring. We ask this in the name of the living Christ and for his sake always. Amen. If something that God has said to you in the last hour or the last day or the last week, the last month, the last few years has finally come to you as an urging to give your life to Jesus Christ. I pray that you would do that today. There will be an opportunity for you to meet with me if you'd like in a more quiet setting, but if you'd like to do that in the service today, that would be fine too. If you're coming to us from another church and you'd like to do that today, you may certainly make that commitment from here with me as well. And by the way, if you've given your life to Jesus before, but you realize you only gave part, or you gave it for the wrong reasons, or you thought that you were chasing after something that would bring you into a more powerful position in the world, and you see now that that's not what Jesus was calling you to at all. Come and make that commitment for the second time, the next time, whatever time. For the rest of you, the chancel rail is open so that you might come and listen for the voice of Jesus Christ calling you 
into this upside down life where the last are first, the first are last. If you would hear his voice, I pray that you would do so during this final hymn. And whatever commitment you need to make, make it here or in coffee with the pastor as we sing our closing hymn. Make that commitment today. It's my responsibility to remind you if you are a leader here in our church, an officer of the church, or you hold a position uh, of responsibility, our charge conference is today at 2 o'clock. You'll see in the bulletin that it's listed from 2 to 6. That's the Clusters Charge Conference. We are taking turns with various churches. Our part will only be about 20 or 30 minutes. If you can be here at 2 o'clock, we would love to have you in the ball classroom. The goal is to have more people in that classroom than it can hold so that we have to move to a larger room. It will be a chance for us to settle up the business of the, the church for the next year and to report on some of the things that we have accomplished this year. If you're able to be there, our district superintendent would welcome you. And by the way, Penny Story has snuck into the very back row back there. We welcome Penny. She's the real brains of the outfit at the district office. We know that. Welcome. Glad you're here. As we go forth from this place to return in a few minutes for our charge conference, receive now the benediction that we give one another. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go turn the world upside down in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.